Good morning, Granite Bay Hilltop Church family. I want to welcome you, any who may be visiting. I was here doing a little maintenance at the church yesterday about noon, and I saw a family out in front of the sign taking a picture, and I later met them. They, had, uh, they were from Germany. They could not be with us today, but they drove from San Francisco to see the church building. I thought, wow, that's commitment. And so I was glad I could time it where I could be here with them and, and greet them as well. I want to welcome our friends who are watching online. We know, of course, that uh, the Granite Bay Church has a lot of online members. Uh, for some reason, they have no local church they can attend, and they participate in worship each week, and we welcome you as well. Now, our study today, this message, is uh, probably is as important as it gets. You could say it's a, an issue of life and death. And we're talking about how to get your name in the book of life. Yes, the Bible talks about a particular book of life. In fact, the Bible talks about several books. A little amazing fact, the biggest library in the world is in Washington, D.C., and it's the Library of Congress. And according to Guinness Book of World Records, the U.S. Library of Congress has 838 miles of bookshelves. That means, not, uh, California is about 900 miles long. That means that you could, in theory, drive from Oregon to Mexico, which takes about 15 hours, and you would have bookshelves about eight feet high on one side the entire way. And they are adding to that number all the time. They have 164 million items. And your tax dollars are paying to keep it all organized. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about a lot of books. Books without number. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, he talked about a lot of books. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 12, he said, Of making many books there is no end. And students will be happy to know Solomon said, Much study is a weariness to the flesh. And he was the wisest man who ever lived. He's not against study, but he said, you know, even back then before the printing press, he said there's so many books. John, the end of the Gospel of John, you know what John said? John 21, verse 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So what you have in the Gospels, John is saying, is really a, a summary of the life of Jesus dealing with the high points. And books go back a long time. Probably the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. I mean, it was written back when people were living, you know, 210 years, and even back then, Job said, Job 19, 23, Oh, that my words were written, that they were inscribed in a book. Books are mentioned about 186 times in the Bible. Now, the Hebrew word for book, just give you a little background before we dive into this, is sifar, and it simply means writing, letter, register, scroll, or what we would call today a book. The Greek word I bet you're going to recognize is Biblion, or Biblos. And there was a Phoenician city uh, that was called Biblos, and they carried a lot of the Egyptian papyrus, and so it's believed that that's where they get the word book from, is because so many books came out of Biblos, they called it a, a Biblos. And when you say the word Bible, you're not actually saying book, but originally this would mean a collection of books, which it is, 66 books. And so that's where we get the word Bible, from the word book. Now, that's just kind of background as we delve into the big issue. There is a book that is the most important book. And you say, Pastor Doug, isn't that the Bible? Well, in many ways it is, in that this book tells us about another book. There are some people who never had a Bible, but they're going to be in heaven. But there will not be anybody in heaven whose name is not in the book of life. It is the most important book. We're going to put some scriptures on the screen, and I think it'll speak for itself. For example, Revelation 21, verse 27. But there shall by no means enter it, speaking of heaven, 
anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Who's going to heaven? Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then you look in Revelation 20, verse 15. And anyone who was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Now, friends, do you realize that we just kind of separated the whole world and anyone who ever has lived, is living, or will live into two very simple categories. Those that will be in heaven are in the book of life, and if they're not in the book of life, they're going to the lake of fire. So how important is it for you to know that your name is written in the book of life? Can you think of anything more important? But wait, there's more. Revelation 13, verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Now speaking of the last day prophecies, meaning worship the beast, who have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In the last days, we want the seal of God. That's one criteria of the saved. But anybody who worships the beast, their names are not in the book of life, meaning they are lost. Revelation 17, verse 8. By the way, you'll only find the, the term book of life about eight times in the Bible specifically. References to the book of life, uh, you could argue between 12 and 14 times. It's not always called the book of life, but you'll see as we proceed. Revelation 17, verse 8. And the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life. Those who are amazed and wondering after the beast, their names are not in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, some people have said from the foundation of the world, did God write our names in the book of life at the foundation of the world? No, this is a reference back where it talks to, talks to us about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The provision was made to have our names put in that book from the foundation of the world. A couple of simple questions. So where is the book of life? You can read in Hebrews 12, verse 22, and it's verse 23. But you've come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Where's the book? Where is that registry? But there's more. If you look in Luke 10, verse 20, Jesus said, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So this is a book that is in heaven. You're not going to find it in the Library of Congress. Who controls the book of life? If you want your name in that book, it'd be good to know that. Revelation 5, verse 2, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Worthy, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And then verse 7, it says, Then he, the Lamb, came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So the only one who is worthy to open the book is the Lamb. In fact, maybe it'd be a good idea if you have your Bibles, turn with me in your book of books, turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 5. This whole chapter is really dedicated to a book. And, but it may not be specifically speaking of the book of life here, but it's a, it's a good idea to understand what's going on. So Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, you've got the introduction, Jesus appears, seven messages to the seven churches. Revelation 4, John the Revelator is caught up to heaven. He sees this heavenly throne with the creatures and the servants of God around the throne. And the big dramatic opening is he sees a book. Turn with me to chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, book, written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now just some trivia for the Bible scholars here. They're not sure where to put that comma uh, the way that some translations, and you may have one this way, some translate it written inside and on the back, comma, sealed with seven seals. Others translate it written inside on written inside, comma, and on the back sealed with seven seals. So the question is, is the scroll written on the front and the back like the Ten Commandments? It says on both sides, or is it saying it's written on the inside, no one can read it, the outside is sealed with seven seals? I'm inclined to go with that, but we can still be friends if we disagree. 
Uh, but just letting you know that there's no punctuation in the original Greek and they've wondered, was it written on both sides or is it saying written inside and on the back, the seals? Anyway, took that too far. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll, the book, and to loose its seven seals? And no one in heaven or under the earth, no one in heaven or in the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open it and read the scroll or look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and on the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Now, which is it? Is it a lion or is it a lamb? Or is it both? Jesus. First time he came like a lamb. He's coming next time like a lion. Right? A lot of churches have that background. They're all mixed up. They think he's coming quietly next time. A lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns, symbol of perfect power, seven eyes, perfect knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand, God the Father, him who sat on the throne. And it says, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Another picture of the sanctuary here. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. Now notice it summarizes the redeemed in this passage here. Summarizes the gospel. You were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people and made us kings and priests to our God and we will reign on the earth. So this lamb is the one who can open the book. Now is this the book of life? Well, yes and no. It's certainly describing the history of those who are in the book of life. But what happens is it's really a book of prophecy about the ones that are in the book. And when it begins then in chapter 6, it talks about opening those scrolls one by one and the whole book of Revelation is unfolded. And from this point on, the history of the church is unfolded. Now, who understands the future but God? Who can know the future? Think about what's involved in knowing, living beyond time. And so only Jesus has the right to redeem us because he's defeated the devil and enter our names in that book. So Jesus is the one that has that right. Moving on here. There are other books that are mentioned along with the book of life. Don't get them confused. Look in Daniel 7, another big courtroom scene here. Daniel 7 verse 9, starting with verse 9. I watched until the thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days, this would be God the Father again on the throne, the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame and its wheels burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him and 10,000 times 10,000. By the way, it's the largest number in the Bible right here. The Greeks had no way of mentioning another infinite higher number than this. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. That's plural. You look in Revelation, you see a similar scene. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books, plural, were opened. Is that the book of life? No. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So you get the books plural, and they got another book, singular. You want to be in the book. But everything you and I have ever done is in the books. And it says, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books. So the, we are judged, we heard, according to our works, we're saved by grace. Your works are going to demonstrate whether you were saved by grace. And one of those important works, of course, is to believe in Jesus. Now, some are thinking, how could God possibly have a book giving the details of every single person through their lives? I mean, where in the world would you store a library like that? I already mentioned the Library of Congress, but you know, we also have the National Archives 
that has more data technically than the Library of Congress. There is so much information in the National Archives that they had to convert a mine underground. They got trucks that drive into this lime mine in um, Missouri, I think it is, and, and they got miles and miles of corridors with the books in the National Archives. Google has data centers. They're building new ones all the time. And they estimate that Google currently stores 10 million terabytes of information. They just built a big data center in the Netherlands because it's a cooler up there and you've got to cool those servers across the street, across the parking lot from where you're sitting. And amazing facts, we've got our holy of holies. Way down in the basement, surrounded by concrete, we've got the servers that operate all the amazing facts websites and they're very carefully air conditioned and protected because a lot of information there. By the way, we do have it backed up offsite as well. But uh, you know how much information Google has on just you? And every time you do a search, you know how many searches? There are billions of searches happening every day. I forget how many million a second around the world. They chronicle every one of those. Think about that enormous data. Now, if man can do that, can God do it? I mean, he says, I got the hairs of your head numbered. It's nothing. Don't make any jokes. About me. He says, that's nothing for me. You laughed anyway, didn't you? So the biggest book in the world is a book that is printed by, I think it's called the Millennial House uh, Australia. It is an atlas that is six by nine. When they open it up, it weighs 330 pounds, costs $100,000 per copy. Now there is actually a heavier book called the Book of Muhammad that is in Dubai that weighs over 3,000 pounds. This would be the biggest by dimension. A 3,000 pound book. God has books of contain everything. You can read in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14. Fear God and keep his commandments. For God, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. How much is brought into judgment? Every work. That kind of makes you shudder. And Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, but I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. You know, you get a little nervous when someone pulls out a tape recorder to tape your conversation. Well, God's got a record of everything that we've ever said. He even knows everything we've ever thought. He not only knows what we did, he knows why we did it. God has a record. I mean, look at the infinite size of space. He has a record of everything. Malachi 3, verse 16 through 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened to them. He's talking about God-fearing people. So a book of remembrance was written. So it's not just people that did bad deeds that are recorded. Good deeds are recorded. Everything is recorded. A book of remembrance was written before him for those that fear the Lord and meditate on his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son. Psalms 58 verse, sorry, 56 verse 8, it talks about my tears are in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And so even David understood that God's got books. Now, you know, even books in our time have gone through quite an evolution used to be they used clay cuneiform and they'd press it in the clay and they'd bake them and that was the book. And they had this one library with 14,000 clay tablets written in cuneiform and they still haven't deciphered them all uh, that they had discovered when excavating. And they had the papyrus books where it was written on rolls and the Dead Sea Scrolls were written on leather and then they started binding books, oh, I guess about 600 A.D., and there may be a little earlier than that. And then, of course, printing press came along, and that changed everything. And now for us sitting here today, even a printed book can seem like an old thing. How many of you still like to read a book you can hold in your hands? I do. How many of you also listen to books online? I I'm doing more and more of that. I'm getting through a lot more books as I drive now doing that. We have the Kindle and the Nooks and all these different devices and the audio books. How, what does God's book look like in heaven? I don't know. 
I think, you know, God's got records of everything. I don't think it looks like a Google, Google data center with, you know, servers and servers that are watched by angels. I don't think they're paper books where God has got printer's ink on his fingers from reading all the books. How he stores it, I don't know. You know, the Bible says the things in heaven are beyond our understanding. We can't even imagine it. All we need to know is it's recorded. Amen? He's using words that we understand. Everything is recorded. Isaiah 65, verse 6. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but I will repay, even repay in their bosom your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord. He says, it's written before me. Now, are there any books missing? Not in God's library. Sometimes people want to know, Pastor Doug, are there any books missing from the, the Bible? How many of you have heard about these missing books or secret books? And many of them are apocryphal books. They never were supposed to be part of the Bible and they've been made up. Uh, but the Bible does talk about some books that we don't have. First Chronicles 29, verse 29, the book of Nathan the prophet. Well, we don't have that. Second Chronicles 20, verse 34, talks about the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani. We don't have that one. In Joshua 10, verse 13, it talks about, are they not written in the book of Jasher? I'd love to read the book of Jasher. We don't have it. A lot of books have been lost through history. One of the biggest libraries in history was the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. They still have a library there. And Julius Caesar destroyed much, if not most of it. And a lot of history was lost. It's kind of sad. But God has not lost any books. God still has all of his books. So we're getting to the important point here where we want to know about how to get our name in the book of life. Why do we need our names in the book of life? Because there's those other books. And if we stand before God without our names in the book of life and all we have is the book of deeds and since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the penalty for sin is what? And what do we all deserve? So it's crucial that we find out about how to get our name in the book of life and what happens to the record of bad deeds of the wicked. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, Paul makes it clear there is court evidence. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one might receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. It's not just in Revelation it says you're judged by your works. Paul says the same thing. But here's some good news. God has an eraser. It's made out of the blood of Christ. In Ezekiel 18, notice what he says. But if a wicked man, that would be all of us before we're forgiven, but if a wicked man turns from all his sins, that's called repentance, which he has committed, and he keeps all my statutes and does what is, what is lawful and right, he will surely live. He will not die. Catch this. None of his transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. That means all those things in the book that we've done wrong, none of them will be remembered against him. It says, because of his righteousness, which he has done, he turns from righteousness to righteousness. He shall live. Jesus says in John 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he that hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and he will not come into judgment. Now, wait a second. It says, but he's passed from death to life. Didn't we just read that all will stand before the judgment seat of God? Yeah, all means all. And every knee will bow. Good, bad, good angels, bad angels. Every knee will bow to God. All will stand before God. But in that judgment, God is going to say, your, your bad works are all gone. I can't remember them. I seem to remember throwing them in the depths of the sea. And all I see here is the book of remembrance of your good works. I, I want that experience. I don't want to face things I've done which I won't go into. The Bible says that if your sins are not covered, those things are done in secret will be proclaimed from the housetops. I don't want that. You don't want it either. You'd have no time to worry about what 
is being proclaimed from my housetop because you'd be too preoccupied worried about what's being proclaimed from your housetop. So that's good news. He casts our sins into the depths of the sea. So if you look with me in Daniel 12, verse 1, speaking of the last days, at that time Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as was never since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people, God is telling Daniel, your people, the faithful, the children of Abraham who are children of Abraham by blood and by faith. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Will be delivered. Everyone found written in the book. What book is he talking about? The book of life here. So, Here's the big question that we posed at the beginning of the message. How do we get our names written in the book of life? Let me just review, very important. The only ones going to heaven, we read the verses, are those who have their names in the book of life. Some will be saved before the age of accountability. There'll be some who were saved and maybe they couldn't even read. There'll be some who were saved and they maybe weren't even church members. Because God is going to, he's going to judge people differently than you and I might. And there'll be people who are in the church that will not be saved because of membership. So how God saves, uh, you know, says they that have done good, the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. There everyone who's in heaven is there because of the blood of Jesus. Is this clear? It is the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. But I think we'll be surprised. But nobody's going to be there whose name is not in the book of life. If your name is not in the book of life, everybody in that second category goes to the lake of fire. They are lost. How do we get our names in the book of life? John 5, 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he that hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Can you say amen? And shall not come into judgment but he's passed from death to life, believing in Jesus. And I read this to you before I wanted to read it again. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's key to getting your name in the book of life. What does it mean to believe in him? That's a big question. It doesn't mean just to say, I believe that he exists the devils believe that it will not save them it doesn't even mean to say i believe he died for the sins of the world a lot of lost people will say lord we preached in your streets they believe that too he'll say i don't know you to believe in the lord means to believe his word to believe in what he taught to follow him to take up your cross and deny yourself and say you are my lord and my savior it's not just believing with your mouth and saying lord lord but being willing to do his will amen a surrender to the Lord. It doesn't mean you can do it in your own strength. Jesus said, without me, you can't do anything. But don't forget, Paul said, through Christ I can do how much? I can do all things. So we come to the Lord, as Ezekiel said, we turn from our wickedness, we repent of our sins, and he wipes out our wicked deeds and he puts our name in the book of life. There's a great quote in the book, Great Controversy, page 480. The book of life contains the names of all who have entered into the service of God. Jesus reiterates that in Luke chapter 10. When 70 disciples, these are not just apostles, these are just disciples like you. He sends them out two by two, they're witnessing, they're sharing their faith, they're even casting out devils. They come back and they're so excited, they say, I had no idea we had the superpower casting out devils. Jesus said, no, don't, don't get excited about that, the miracles. He said, if you're going to rejoice, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Who is he talking to? People that were in his service. Look again at Daniel chapter 12. I just read to you the first part. I want to read the second part. Daniel 12, I read verse 1. Michael stands up. There's a great time of trouble such as there never has been since there was a nation. At that time, thy people will be delivered. Everyone found written in the book. Then go to verse 3. And it says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness. 
These are the servants of God that are sharing their faith. They're living the life. They're trying to turn people from their sin to righteousness. doesn't mean you've got to be a preacher or an evangelist or a teacher. But everybody, by our life, has an influence. Your life will have an influence. It will tell in the lives of others one way or the other. Those who accept Jesus and they serve him, those are the ones whose names are in the book of life. He is their Lord. They are his servants. You know, I read somewhere that the most expensive book in the world, you know what it is? I used to think it was the Gutenberg Bible. At one time during World War II, America has somewhere in our museum a Gutenberg Bible, and they hid it in Fort Knox during World War II because they figured it was such a valuable, an original Gutenberg Bible, very few of them intact. But as far as cost, the most expensive book in the world, you've got it on your screen there, it's called the Codex Lester. Now, I know that sounds like a different word, but that's how they say it in England, Lester. And it is actually a notebook of Leonardo da Vinci that was bought by Bill Gates, and he paid over $30 million for that book. But that's not really the most expensive book. The most expensive book is the book of life. Because it costs the life of the Son of God to get your name in that book. You thought that'd be a good place to end the sermon, Pastor Doug, but I'm not done. <laughs> Can you know your name is in the book now? You're not sure what to say. Will you believe what the Bible says? Jesus said, I just read it to you in Luke 10, Jesus said, rejoice in this, that the, not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather because your names are written in the book of life. Let me give you another verse. You need at least two or three witnesses. 1 John 3, verse 14. For we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Philippians 4, verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement and also with the rest of my fellow workers whose name are in the book of life. He says not whose names they hope will be someday. He says, my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. 1 John 5, 13. That doesn't mean you can't be lost once you're saved. We'll get to that. 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Now, would you say that it's safe to say it's the same thing to say your name is in the book of life and that you have eternal life? Sure. John says that you might know now, this is so important for us to understand that because if you have no idea or no confidence about being saved, then how can you rejoice in the gospel? You know, I've been to the airport several times and I am always very careful to get a reservation in advance. And um, I've got my ticket. I print out my ticket. I'm, I'm really careful. I've learned by experience. I print out my ticket at home. I get it on my phone digitally, and when I check my bags, I get another one. Don't tell them, but I usually show up with three. And then while we're waiting for the plane, I kick back. I get there early. I'm very different from Pastor Ross. <laughs> and my wife. No, if you ask, Pastor Ross will tell you. He says, he says I like it where I'm the last one on the plane before they close the door. Oh, yeah. He just hates sitting around in the airport. He just says, I just want to walk through, walk through, walk on, get off. Yeah, let's take off. And um, Karen always tells me, while I'm at the gate, we're just getting ready to board, she says, I'll be right back. <laughs> so we stay married because I give her her own boarding pass. And I say, I hope I see you there. <laughs> but then there's people who are on standby. Anyone know what standby is? Yeah, sometimes it means you stand by and the plane takes off without you. <laughs> and they got a list that pops up on the monitor there. It'll say that you got these people on standby. And you can see those people. You know who's on standby. Because while the people with confirmation, they're sitting back and they're snoozing, they're talking to their friends, they're catching up on email. Standby, they're going like this. They're looking about, oh man, there's too many people here and they're counting heads. Well, how big is a plane? And, and they have no peace because they don't know. We got a lot of people say they're Christians and they're just going through life on standby. And they're not happy and no one wants the religion because no one wants to be unhappy. 
If you don't have any peace or confidence, Jesus keeps his promise. He said, if you take up your cross and follow me, if you turn and repent of your sins, you can have everlasting life. You will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. You ought to be happy. The other thing is not only will you be happier and you'll be a better witness, but another illustration. So this very wealthy man, he decides to give two of his friends a piece of property. He says, I'm deeding this property over to you, and I hope you go ahead and you're welcome to clear the woods and plant some farms and use the wood to mill lumber and build a house and you can get some, some dairy cattle. And he says, uh, it's your ranch. I'm giving it to you as a gift. One of them takes the deed. He's so happy. He drops it at the courthouse and he goes off and he starts to cut down the trees and he, he starts to build a house and he starts to plant a farm and he gets some cattle and builds the fences. And, but the other fellow thinks this is too good to be true. And he keeps going to the courthouse saying, is it in my name? Uh, can he take it away? Hires lawyers, keeps checking. Who's going to get more work done? The one who's constantly wondering if the deed is his or the one who believes it and then moves out and just starts getting busy. It's important for us to have some confidence about our relationship. Now, if you've not surrendered to the Lord, then you shouldn't have false confidence. But if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, he wants you to enjoy that. Now, there's a sobering thought. Can a name be taken out of the book of life once it's entered? How will we find our answer? What does the Bible say? Exodus chapter 32, after the children of Israel were saved from Egypt and they made the golden calf, God said, I'm going to wipe them out and I'm going to make a new nation of you, Moses. Doesn't sound like they're going to be his people anymore. God at least has that option, doesn't he? He's God. He says, and Moses intercedes for the people and he says, yet now, Lord, this is Exodus 32, 32, yet now, Lord, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, Blot me out of your book which you have written. Now, do we know what book that is? Yeah, by the time of Adam, when the sacrificial was established at the foundation of the world, that's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve. It's the, their nakedness was covered with skins. That's how Abel knew to sacrifice a lamb. God had entered names in a book. Moses knew about that book. He said, take my name, blot my name out of your book. You know what God said? Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But Moses interceded and their names were kept in the book. You can read in Psalm 69, 28. David says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not written with the righteous. This is another example of the book of life in the Old Testament, but it doesn't use the word book of life. It calls it the book of the living pretty clear it's the book of life, right? Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now the very idea he says he that overcomes I will not blot his name out of the book of life. What does that mean? Why would he even say that if it wasn't possible to have the name blotted out? So when are those names blotted out? There are people who they take the name of Jesus and they say they're following the Lord and they say they trust the Lord, but their lives don't bear that out. There's something called the pre-advent judgment. Now stay with me. When the Lord comes, is he distributing rewards when he comes? He's going to reward everyone according to his work. Does the Lord know when he comes, who's saved, who's lost, who is caught up to meet him in the air, who does not? get caught up to meet him, who's resurrected in the first resurrection, who is left behind. The Lord knows all that. So if there are people who have taken the name of Jesus, but they haven't really served Jesus, there obviously needs to be some investigation prior to his coming to determine if they were authentic. That's going on now. But yes, names can be taken out of the book, but you know that doesn't bother me. I'm actually excited that names can be blotted out. You know what that means? If names can be blotted out of the book of life, that means sins can be blotted out of the book of death. And I am so encouraged by the news that sins can be blotted out of the book of death. That God has an eraser. I just want to make sure it gets erased from the right book. Amen? I want my sins erased. 
Don't you? And now as World War II was coming to an end, they've got a list that is in the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And it's a typewritten list with 1,100 names on it. And it was created by a man named Oscar Schindler. And he had workers that served him. They were building commodities during the war. And he tried to get as many people as he could into his service because he knew what was happening to the other Jews. And he did everything he could, quite honestly, by hook or crook, to get people on his list. Because he knew everyone on his list would be moving with him to a new factory in Poland that was out of danger, and those who were not on the list were going to Auschwitz. Karen and I stopped at Auschwitz last year. Was it last year? We were in Poland. I think it was last year. And uh, it's a pretty bad ending. You know, the whole world, if they don't know Jesus, they're lost. The Bible says if their names are not in the book of life, they're going to the lake of fire. Not only does the Lord want us to have our names in that book, that we come to him and say, Lord, we want to be your servants. We are willing to serve you because the alternative, you don't want to serve the devil. You're going to serve somebody. Did you know that? If you think I just don't want to serve anybody, you're making your decision who you serve. And he is a bad taskmaster. Yes, you need to take up your cross. There are trials or challenges in the Christian life. It's a whole lot worse to serve the devil. So in closing, I'd like to encourage you to say, Lord, I want to surrender my life to Jesus today. I am willing to repent of my sins and turn from my evil ways, to have your blood wash away my sins and enter my name in the book of life. Don't you want that experience? There's going to be a judgment day. It's like in Matthew 18, there was a day when a king took accounts and all the servants were brought before him. It's like when Ahasuerus couldn't sleep and the records were read and rewards were given. There is going to be a judgment day and there's only two options. Your name is in the book of life or then you'll be judged otherwise by the deeds. And uh, that's not a good ending. So before we sing our closing song, I'd just like to ask how many today would like to say, Lord, I want my name written in that book. I'd like to accept Jesus. Some of you maybe have never done it before and you can do it today. If you're going to rejoice, Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So if you have invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, if you said, I want to serve him, turn from my sins, he says he will delete your sins through his blood and write your name in the book of life. Amen. How many of you? Is that good news? Amen. How many of you want to share that good news with others? Amen. Loving Lord, we thank you for the wonderful promise that if we come to you and if we turn to you that you will no longer remember our sins but you will cast them into the depths of the sea and we will not enter into judgment for those things but marvelous grace and then that grace also gives us the power to live a new kind of life through your spirit to be justified to be sanctified to be with you in the kingdom Lord we pray right now you'll write our names in your book and that we can be ready for your soon coming. Be among those who are delivered. Everyone found written in the book. We thank you. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You say amen, friends? Amen. Gospel's good news. God bless you. For those who are visiting, we receive our offerings at the end at the door. You'll see ushers there. You have a wonderful Sabbath. Thank you for watching, friends. Does the Bible tell us what's coming next? Join us for Panorama of Prophecy an amazing Bible adventure for an epic time in history. Watch 6.30 a.m. on Sunday, Channel 9 Gem, or watch via YouTube at Amazing Facts Oceana.